Okay, guys, here we go. We're going to have our next lecture. Um, this time it's going to be over meiosis. The topic is uh, meiosis, which is creation of sex cells. So let me get my notes set up. Hopefully you guys are ready. And we are starting on this slide. Let me get my movie ready and we should be good to go. Okay, so on the first slide, um, you see this is a vocabulary term called somatic cells. Okay, these are body cells. Okay, you can see them listed right here, such as skin cells, muscle cells, nerve cells, I can keep on going, pancreatic cells, stomach cells, basically every single cell in the body with the exception of sex cells falls into this category. Okay, so all of our body cells, which soma, the prefix in Latin, means body. So these are body cells. Okay, human somatic cells contain 46 chromosomes. That is our genome. Our total endowment that we have in our body cells is 46 chromosomes. Now out of those, if I asked you well, where did those 46 chromosomes come from, hopefully y'all would know that, well, 23 came from your mom originally and 23 came from your dad. Because we all started off as one cell big. I know we don't like to think about it, but this zygote, which is what we all started off with, was because dad's sperm cell which contains 23 chromosomes, united with mom's egg cell, which also contains 23 chromosomes. And so we all started off as a zygote that had, had 46 chromosomes. Okay, now at that point, that cell decided to go through asexual reproduction, which we were talking about over the last couple of units, which is the cell cycle. That cell split and made more cells with 46 chromosomes. And we became multicellular, as that happened over and over and over again. Okay, so that's how we got all of our body cells. And as those cells uh, split and created more and more and more that had 46 chromosomes, they started to specialize, which means that they each took on a certain job and some became muscle cells, some became skin cells, some became liver cells, nerve cells, stomach cells, et cetera, et cetera. And so we all started as one cell big with 46 chromosomes, the original number 23 from mom and 23 from dad. Okay, so the goal of this unit is we're going to talk about how do we get these egg cells and how do we get these sperm cells that have half the amount of information and how do we know which part of the information that they're going to carry, okay? So going back over here, somatic cells, which are body cells, are diploid, the term is diploid, di means two, okay, and then ploid refers to sets of chromosomes. So these somatic cells or body cells have two sets of chromosomes because one set is from mom and one set is from dad. Now the prefix that we use to represent that is 2n. So you would write for a human 2n equals 46. If I was talking about a fruit fly, for them 2n equals 8 because their total endowment is they have 8 chromosomes. So for us we have 46. So in all of our body cells 2n equals 46. Okay, now we also look at the next little bulleted point, which is out of those 46 chromosomes, they are matched pairs. Because for each pair, like you see in this picture down here, here's chromosome pair number one. There is one single chromosome that you see here that came from mom and one single chromosome here that came from dad and they are matches to each other. Okay, that's what we call matched pair of chromosomes. And each one that makes up this homologous pair, we call it a homolog. So this would be a homologous pair of chromosomes because they match each other. Now, what do I mean by this word match? Okay, there's something very important that you need to understand. In this picture, you can see dark black banding, okay, down each of these chromosomes. I'm kind of drawing my lines so that you can see that. Those dark bands are genes, okay, and each gene codes for a certain trait. And on each of those genes, you would see DNA nucleotides that would make up bases like A's, T's, G, and C. So a gene is a unit on a chromosome, okay, it's a unit on a chromosome that codes for a certain trait. So on our chromosome pairs, this one is a homologous or a homolog pair compared to this one because they have genes that code for the same trait found in the same location. Okay, now that location that I just mentioned in, in um, genetics classes, we call it a locus. Okay, this is not one of those flying cicadas that we have. This is actually a different term in genetics. So a locus is a point like right there that you can see, which is a location where a certain gene is found. So we could say, for example, um, that we know the locus 
of many genes in the human um, genome project, we discovered that like on chromosome pair number two, there's a certain locus that codes for eye color. There's a certain locus that codes for hair color, et cetera. Okay, so that's kind of what we're refer referring to there is location, location of a certain gene. Okay, jumping down to this part down here, um, we like to say that um, in humans, we have out of our 46 chromosomes, go back up here and look at the number, we have 46. Out of those 46, 44 of them we call autosomes. It's the first 44 are defined as autosomes. What does that mean? They contain information about us, traits about us, everything except for any sexual information. The last two chromosomes in all humans are called the sex chromosomes. So down here, this is a, um, I'm going to get rid of some of this because it's getting too confusing for me. But if um, I show you this nice clean slate, this picture is called a karyotype, K-A-R-Y-O-T-Y-P-E. It's actually a picture of your chromosomes. You can take one of these pictures um, in metaphase. It's a really perfect phase to catch them because they're already attached together. So we can get a karyotype of our DNA. So our first 44 chromosomes are called autosomes, and the last two are our sex chromosomes. So right here, this individual is a boy or male. How do I know that? Because they have a chromosome at location X, and they have a small little chromosome at location Y. And if you have an XY, you are a male. Okay, a karyotype for a female would have two very similar sized chromosomes, and we would say that it was XX, and that would be a female. So in all of us, if I looked at any of your somatic cells, any of your body cells, this is what the karyotype would look like because you would have 46 chromosomes one from mom, one from dad, that contain matching information, and um, they would be known the first 44, which would be basically the first 22 pair, because 22 pair means 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and so on and so forth. So the first 22 pair are autosomes, and the last pair are sex chromosomes. Okay? That's very different than the next slide. Okay, the next slide, which is what we're focusing on because we want to talk about meiosis, is we look at your gametes. Okay, gametes are sex cells. So for males, this is your sperm. For females, this is your egg cells. Okay, these are the only cells in the body that are haploid. Okay, think of hap as half. Okay, half. Because haploid are, they, these are cells that contain half of the amount of genetic material. So for us, half is 23. So we're not going to use 2N, we're going to use N. So in humans, N equals 23, and that's how I would write the genome for a sex cell. Okay, so why must we do that? It's really imperative that we create cells with half the amount of genetic information because whenever it comes time to sexually reproduce, for sexual reproduction, in fertilization, a haploid sperm cell and a haploid egg cell join, unite together, and so N plus N equals 2N. So if I've got 23 chromosomes here and 23 chromosomes, this is a sperm, and this is an egg, then I'm going to end up with a zygote that has 46 chromosomes. So in order to continue the, the human race and have this happen appropriately, we must go through a process to create these haploid sex cells, and it must happen appropriately because if I have the wrong number of chromosomes in this sperm cell or in this egg cell, then I could have a zygote that has the wrong number of chromosomes, which is known as a genetic disorder. Perfect example, you guys are very familiar with Down syndrome. Down syndrome, and we'll talk about it later with genetics, is trisomy 21, okay, which is where either this egg or this, excuse me, this sperm or this egg ends up with an extra copy of a chromosome on location number 21. So one of these would be carrying a 24 chromosomes, and if I take a sperm with 24 and an egg with 23, I end up with a baby that has 47 chromosomes, which is not the proper number. Okay, if it happens at chromosome pair number 21, this is known as Down syndrome. If it, if it happens at a different pair of chromosomes, then it has a different name for a disorder. Okay, and, and we'll talk more about this, like I said, in genetics, which I know some of you are dying to get to. Just hang in there, Corinne. We'll get there eventually. Um, anyway, here's your diagram. You can kind of see that in order to restore the diploid number in a human, we must go through fertilization. So if you just start over here, here's your egg, 
okay, or your ovum, which is N. There's your little sperm, that's N. Restoring them, in other words, joining them together in sexual reproduction for fertilization, will restore the diploid number to a zygote that has 46 chromosomes. As that goes through development, growth and development, we create organisms like this male and female through asexual reproduction, which is mitosis, or I like to call it, you guys know this, the cell cycle. And so I will create a multicellular organism through that part, so 2n equals 46, and then they must form sex cells in the female happens in the ovary, and the male happens in the testy, and through meiosis we will create these haploid cells. So let's take a little bit more of an in-depth look at this. A um, couple little bulleted points here. Um, I want you to know that meiosis is special. It's special um, in humans. It occurs so that we can have gametes that are haploid. That's my N. Um, like I said a minute ago, it happens in the ovaries of females, happens in the testes of males. It's the only place that this occurs in. This involves specialized cells in the ovaries and testes. And actually, these cells that start off are actually 2N. That's a big, huge, put an asterisk by this. The specialized cells that are in the ovaries and testes start off in the beginning as 2N. So if they're starting off with a full set of chromosomes, that's going to tell you that we can't just divide once, we're going to have to divide twice. The reason being is I'm still going to go through interphase. Well, you guys already know that in S of interphase, I'm doubling the genetic information. So I'm going to start off with a cell that is 2N, that has 46 chromosomes, and I'm going to double that, but yet I need to produce cells that have half the amount of genetic information. So I can't just go through one division. You can see right here, we are going to divide the cell twice, okay? We will end up with, if we're dividing twice, not two cells, we end up with four cells. And those four cells have half the amount of the original chromosome number. Much different than the process mitosis. If we go through mitosis, we end up with same number, same amount of DNA, meaning I start off with a cell that's 2N, and I better end up with cells that are 2N. That's not this. Okay, in humans, one thing that I want you to know that's very interesting is males, they will have four viable sperm cells through this process. All four of those sperm cells survive and are capable of fertilizing the egg. In females, she goes through a special little process called oo genesis, which is where in a female, three of her four sex cells are called polar bodies, and they actually do not make it in most cases, unless you're talking about twins or triplets or etc. Three of them are polar bodies and actually die, and one of them survives and becomes the living egg cell. And so typically a female has one egg produced per month through, through meiosis. Males will have four viable sperm cells, and males go through this every day. So guys are producing sperm every day. Girls are producing an egg cell once a month, which is why if it's not fertilized through sex, then she's got to slough it off in the menstrual cycle. Okay, and we'll talk more about that when we get to the human body. All right, so here's a closer look at the process. This is so cool. I think this is the most interesting thing ever. So in this picture, um, I want you to notice that interphase is not here. However, it did happen, okay? Interphase did occur prior to this point. So we start off with a cell that is 2N equals 46, okay? But remember, in interphase, we go through G1, S, and G2. Same thing, even though this is meiosis, we're still going to go through G1, S, and G2. So the same things happen just like they did in the cell cycle. G1 is normal growth normal, um, like replacing organelles, uh, cell respiration, photosyn uh, photosynthesis, listen to me, um, <laughs> cell respiration and protein synthesis, and then it switches into S, and it's going to double the DNA. So we're going to actually double the DNA, then we move into G2, and G2, we double all the organelles, we double the centrosomes with the centrioles. Okay, after that, it's going to move right into prophase, but we're going to call it prophase 1. Why? Because I already told you we're going to go through two divisions. So this picture is meiosis 1, because we're going to have a meiosis 1 and a meiosis 2. Now remember, we're trying to make sex cells, so something special is about to happen, and let me show you what that is. In prophase 1, instead of just having a sister chromatid pair up at its centromere, that's what we had in the cell cycle, because we're going to have sex cells at the end, we will have 
to come together, meaning we're going to have, like in this picture, the blue one, let's say this was the chromosome that you got from your dad. The red one is the one that illustrates the chromosome from your mom. So in the beginning, I would have had one, let me change the color here on my Modi. I would have had one blue one right here, and let's say that blue one represented chromosome pair number one in the beginning. The red one would have been the one that matched it, its homolog, that was from mom, and it would have also been number one. So originally, before I did any multiplication in S phase of interphase, what I had was I had a red chromosome that matched a blue one, like this is what I had in the beginning, and this would have been chromosome pair number one. So the blue one was from my dad, and the red one was from my mom, and those would have matched each other. Okay, this is in the beginning. Well, I went through S phase, which meant I replicated this. Okay, so if I replicated this, I should have that replica of the red one. I have this replica of the blue one. So I've got, now instead of just having a sister chromatid pair, like this would have originally been a sister chromatid pair, this sister chromatid pair is going to match up with this sister chromatid pair, and we're going to give it a different name. Okay, so the, the new name for this is it is called either homologous chromosomes, look at the word, homologous chromosomes, why? Because this blue pair set is identical to this one, meaning not identical information, but it's matching as far as its chromosome number one. But the blue ones came from dad, the red ones came from mom. So we're going to call it either homologous chromosomes, or the other word you can use is tetrad. Okay, tetrad. Why tetrad? Because it's four, and we have four chromatids. Okay, now remember guys, these are not, the blue ones and the red ones are not identical, but they are homologous because if this red pair has a gene right here that codes for eye color, this blue pair has a gene in the same location that codes for the same trait. Okay, that's why we use the term homologous chromosomes. Now you might go, well, why would they come up and pair like this? We have to do this to make sure that at the end we have sex cells that are varied meaning I don't want to give a sex cell to my child if I'm going to have a baby. I don't want my baby to look just like my mother or just like my father. And if I didn't pair up like this, I wouldn't have an opportunity to mix up the DNA. Because whenever these come together and form this tetrad, there's an amazing process that occurs called crossing over. Okay, crossing over. And it happens, we're right here in prophase one still. It happens right there in prophase one. What do I mean by crossing over? A piece of this blue chromosome can break off and switch with a piece of the red one. These can actually swap. Why would they do that? That increases genetic variation. It makes sure that when I have at the very end process, when I end up with sex cells, I'm going to have sex cells that I'm going to eventually have a baby with that are basically going to be part of my mom and part of my dad, which means they're part of me. They're going to end up with some of that information. So in prophase one, I've got crossing over that occurs because I have homologous chromosomes that pair up together. So instead of calling them sister chromatids, I'm now using the term tetrad or homologous chromosomes. Now where they attach, you can see this little circle right here, we're not going to call that the centromere. Okay, centromere is technically right there because that's holding these sister chromatids together and these. So what I have is something called a chiasmata. That's a new vocabulary term. Chiasmata is where homologous pairs attach that holds them together. Okay, so that's chiasmata. So a lot of vocabulary here. Now, I didn't even mention the other stuff that's going on in the background, but all the other stuff that happens during prophase of the cell cycle happens here as well, which means I've got disintegration of the nuclear envelope. I've got disintegration of the nucleolus going away. I've got spindle fibers forming and elongating by adding protein microtubules to them. I've got centrosomes moving apart okay, as the cell is preparing to go to the next phase, which is metaphase. So all the same stuff that happens in prophase of the cell cycle is going to happen in prophase of meiosis. The major, major point that you need to make sure you have written down is that we don't have sister chromatid pairs. We have tetrads or homologous chromosomes so that we can go through crossing over to create genetic variation. Okay, that's the big thing. All right, now, the next one, I'm going to get a clean slate here. When we move into metaphase one, guess what? 
Not a big shocker. It's going to be the same things that happen, but instead of having sister chromatids line up in the middle of the cell, we now have our tetrad that lines up in the middle of the cell. So in this picture, here's tetrad, tetrad, tetrad lined up in the middle of the cell. Okay, how do they do that? Same thing. They're attached to these kinetochore microtubules that still attach, comes right into the kinetochore of those sister chromatids. Okay, attaches in there. The imaginary line is still the metaphase plate, but the difference is you see fours, four chromatids, not two, because that we're in metaphase one. Okay, moving into anaphase one, same thing as far as what the cell's doing. We've got shortening of these microtubules. Okay, by the proteins being broken down, but instead of pulling apart sister chromatids, look what we're pulling apart. We're pulling apart the tetrad. So we've got this homologous pair moving this way and this homologous pair moving that way. But we still have, here's the deal, we still have double the amount of genetic information. Okay, so we have too much DNA. So this keeps happening as the cell is elongating. You can see it's getting football shaped. So we're still going to have the pooling to both sides as it moves into telophase and cytokinesis 1. Okay? So as we get into telophase and cytokinesis 1, same stuff, guys. We're going to have the reformation of the nuclear envelope, reformation of the nucleolus. Okay, the DNA, very briefly, is going to uncoil, unravel, and go back into chromatin form. But we still have twice the amount of DNA. Okay, we have too much DNA, but there's a key here. I want you to write this down. The cell at this point is actually haploid. Okay, it is haploid. So we will actually write that it is N right here at the end of meiosis 1. But we can't stop here because we still have two times the amount of DNA. Now you might say, well, why are we, call why are we calling it N? Because these two together right here represent one chromosome. So in this picture, I have one, two, three chromosomes in this cell. I have one, two, three chromosomes in this cell. Okay, but I started off with one, two, three, four, five, six in the original cell over here. So I have half the number of chromosomes, but I still have twice the amount of DNA because they're still paired up as sister chromatids. So I'm going to have to go through a second division. So I have to go through meiosis two. That's why the need exists to divide the cell twice. So I will still have the cleavage furrow form, okay, cleavage furrow initiated, which means I still have my ring of microfilaments in here, as this cell splits into two. But it's very important for you to know that, that these two cells, ooh, whoa, went too fast. Those two cells are haploid. Um, however, they have too much information. And I went too fast, and I can't get this back, so here we go. Let's go back here. All right, so going back to this picture. Here's meiosis 2. Meiosis 2 looks almost identical to mitosis. Okay, if you check this out, it looks almost identical to mitosis or the cell cycle. It's kind of hard to tell sometimes because you still see, look in this picture right here, prophase 2, you've got sister chromatids. Metaphase 2, sister chromatids line up in the middle. Anaphase 2, these are now daughter chromosomes moving to opposite sides. And telophase 2 inside of kinesis, looks just like it did in mitosis. Okay, but the difference is, I want you guys to notice, we jumped right from telophase 1, telophase and cytokinesis 1, we jumped right into prophase 2. What did we skip? Hopefully you all just said we skipped an interphase. And you are exactly right. Okay, now, there is a brief resting period. It's kind of like an, a G2 almost. There's, it's a little brief resting period. But there is no S between meiosis 1 and meiosis 2. If we, did, if we had an S phase, it would be defeating the purpose. We would be doubling the DNA. We can't double the DNA. We're trying to create these are haploid daughter cells, which are sex cells. So we can't double the DNA again. That's why the only thing that exists between the two is a brief rest. And the cells move right into, and notice we have two cells here, they both move right into prophase 2. Okay, now prophase 2, same thing here, it's like a broken record. Nuclear envelope disintegrates, spindle fibers lengthen as proteins are added, centrosomes with centrioles move to opposite sides of the cell, but we have sister chromatids that are still attached. That's why we're going through the second phase. In metaphase 2, they line up in the middle, do a brief head count, Anaphase 2, they pull apart, just like they did in the cell cycle. 
We now have daughter chromosomes. These three go to one cell. There's three. These three go to the other cell. And they are now three individual chromosomes, which means they are technically haploid, which means they are N and they have half the amount of genetic information. Okay, so that's the whole premise about meiosis 2. Okay, that's meiosis 2. Now, there's one thing I wanted to mention and draw your attention to. Do you see how you can see the blue on this sister chromatid, and you can see the blue down here, and you can see the red here and the red there? That was a result of crossing over that happened way back in prophase 1, but you can see how now this is genetically varied, that one's genetically varied. So if this was, let's just choose a female, let's say this was an egg cell right here. If this is an egg cell from the original parent, if this becomes the baby, that means this person's baby, I can't spell, this person's baby on this chromosome will have a little bit of red and a little bit of blue, which means a little bit of this adult's mom and dad. A lot of red on this chromosome, a little bit of blue, means it has a lot of the mom and a little from the dad. This one has a little red, a lot of blue, this one has a lot of red. So you might have traits that you have that are a lot of traits from your mother or a lot of traits from your father because it depends on the crossing over as to how many genes are passed on to these sex cells. Okay, so once again, if this was a female, three of these cells, let's say these two and this one, would die. Why? Because a lot of times in cytokinesis, these will have unequal distribution of the cytoplasm, and three of these will end up being really small eggs, and then one of them will be a large egg. The one that is largest, that has plenty of cytoplasm, is the one that survives and becomes the viable egg that the female can then have sex and have a baby. Um, if she doesn't have sex, like I said, it's sloughed off. Now, in a male, all four of these would be living sperm cells that all four would grow flagella and would be able to fertilize the egg if the guy had sex. Okay, so that's pretty much um, meiosis. Now, this is the part that um, a lot of you are waiting on with the genetics aspect of it. There are things that can go wrong in meiosis, and if they go wrong, it can be very wrong, and you end up with genetic disorders, and um, most genetic disorders are actually fatal if they happen on the autosomes. Okay, so um, it's kind of weird because on, on the first 44 pair of chromosomes, if you end up with an extra copy or you're missing a copy, almost every single one of those disorders is fatal with the exception of Down syndrome. And there's a lot of research into like why is that the case, but Down syndrome is the only survivable autosomal uh, number disorder that we can really report as people can um, live you know, healthy lives. So here's the error. The error is called, look at the word, non, that means not, disjunction. Okay, a disjunction means not joining together, it means separating. Separating. So non-disjunction means failure to separate properly. So go now look at this picture and it's pretty easy to see when could a non-disjunction occur? When do they not separate properly? Well, it could happen in anaphase, right, because that's when chromosomes pull apart. But it could happen in anaphase 1, or it could happen in anaphase 2. So it could happen in either one of those places. It could be in meiosis 1, or it could be in meiosis 2. So meiosis 1 is ana 1, because that's when they pull apart, or meiosis 2, it's ana 2. So in this picture, you can see over here, look to the left, this is what a non-disjunction looks like. These homologous pairs, or this tetrad, stays together, and if it does, then you've now got too much DNA going to one of these cells. So instead of having N, which is normal, this is what the cell should look like over here, there should be two chromosomes in the sex cells, should be two right there, instead of having that, if you have a non-disjunction, you might have cells that have an extra copy, like in these two, or you might have one that are missing a copy. So this picture over here is showing you if those two stick together in, my, this is meiosis 1, by the way, if they stick together in meiosis 1, that means the tetrad doesn't pull apart, then you have this cell that ends up with way too much DNA, so it will be N plus 1, this cell over here is missing this pair that's supposed to be pulling apart to go there and there. So you'll end up with four sex cells. In this case, if it happens in meiosis 1, you've got bad news, bad news, Bad news, bad news. If your error happens in anaphase 1, you've got four sex cells, none of which are normal. That would be a worst case scenario. 
Okay, if the error happens in, in meiosis 2, which is anaphase 2, this is anaphase 1, everything pulled apart properly, okay, and so what happens when it goes to ana 2, instead of these sister chromatids pulling that way and that way, they stay stuck together here. Well, that would mean that out of your four cells that were produced, you have a 50-50 chance that if it was this cell, these are normal. Okay, if it was this cell, it would have one extra chromosome. If it was this cell, it would be missing a chromosome. So this is a bad case, a bad case. This one's actually good and good. Well, what are the odds of this one becoming the baby? Well, it's a one in four chance. So if this was a male and these four sperm cells all lived, he's got a 25% chance if he had a non-disjunction in meiosis 2, that he would have a baby that would be missing a chromosome. He's got a 25% chance that he's going to have a baby that has an extra, and he's got a 50% chance that he's going to have a normal baby. Okay, so those are kind of like big odds. So we'll talk more when we get to genetics about, you know, the actual genetic disorder part of it. But I wanted you to know that the error happens in sex cell formation. All right, so um, this is a little slide that shows you the genetic variation. Um, this is in your book, and I, I'd like you to actually read about this a little bit more. I'm not going to get into total detail, but they talk about, it talks about like if you didn't have genetic variation, then you would have cells at the end that would be all maternal, which means mother, or all paternal in, in genetic information. So we don't want that to happen, so that's why we go through this process. This is what you want the cell to look like. So crossing over increases genetic variability or genetic variation. It happens in prophase one when the tetrads come together and they, they form, remember, they join at their chiasmata. So whenever they join, which you can see right here, here's the chiasmata, here's the chiasmata. When they come together in prophase one, they do this crossing over. Crossing over is this right here, which is where a piece of one sister chromatid breaks off and exchanges with a piece of a sister chromatid on the homolog. Meaning if this little piece here, I'll show you right here, if this piece right here broke off, it would exchange with a piece over here from its homolog. So red and blue would mix right there. The more times that happens, the more genetic variability you have in your sex cells, which means your baby would look a lot like both of your parents and not just like one of your parents. Now keep in mind though, if this was going to be the baby, this is only your half that you're contributing because you've got a male or a female that you would be having sex with that would provide the other half. So you would be a mixture of your mom and dad, your spouse would be a mixture of his or her mom and dad, which means your baby is a mixture of both of your parents because remember we really are just our parents, well that's who we are, that's our genetic information. Okay, so this happens very frequently, just so you, um, this is like a smiley face. If it didn't happen frequently, like I said, you would have children that would look like you or just your spouse, which means they would look like their grandparents. So the more times this happens, the more genetic variation occurs, which means you have kids that don't look exactly alike, which is why the chances of having even siblings that look a lot alike are slim. You can look similar, but not 100% identical. Okay, so we're almost done. Last couple slides. I think this is like maybe one, last one or one more after this. Um, if you compare meiosis to, and here's the word I hate to use, but let's just say cell cycle. If you compare the two processes to each other, okay, you start off with a cell in the beginning. And let's just say this is the beginning right here. This cell in the middle is 2N. And in this picture, this is obviously not a human, 2N equals 4 in this picture. That's this one. So on this side over here, look what you end up with at the end down here. One, two, three, four, which means this cell, 2n equals four. This cell, 2n equals four, which means this side is mitosis. So if you look at, and this is, doesn't include all the phases, but if you notice here, these are sister chromatids, okay? And when they line up, here's metaphase. They then would pull apart in Anna, they'd go through Tela and Cyto, and you would end up with cells that are 2N, that have the full set of DNA. Okay, but the other thing, remember y'all, that that's one chromosome right there. That is now a daughter chromosome that, yes, will uncoil, unravel, and go back to chromatin, but that is a chromosome. So the cell started off with one, two, three, four chromosomes, and these two cells end up with one, two, three, four chromosomes. So it's diploid, diploid. On this side, 
This is still 2n equals 4, but this would be in an ovary testy. We would still go over here, but instead of having such a chromatid, we've got tetrad formation, okay, or homologous pairs. They come together, they cross over in prophase 1. They then go, this is metaphase 1. How do I know that? Because I've got a tetrad formed together right there as homologous pairs. They would then go through anaphase 1, telophase and cytokinesis 1, and I would end up with these two cells that technically are haploid because that is one chromosome, that is one chromosome, so that's two chromosomes, so technically that's haploid, but they are still duplicated, which means I have to go through prophase 2, metaphase 2, anaphase 2, telophase and cytokinesis 2, so I end up with these four cells that have, look, one, two chromosomes. So N equals two, N equals two, N equals two, N equals two. But go back to this. This is after meiosis one. Okay, there's the split. So from here to here is meiosis one. From here to here is meiosis two. Okay, between there, I had a brief resting period with no S phase, no S phase. So I moved right in, and then I ended up with sister chromatids. Okay, so that's meiosis 1 and meiosis 2, and there are my haploid cells at the end. Clear as mud? You got it? There we go. We are done with our video on meiosis. Make sure you watch it and read your book. Awesome. Y'all have a great night.